Let's take another look at the relationship between women and film in Japan. Where we recently discussed women on film, this time we figured it better to discuss women in the director's chair. As you may know, from an American perspective, a woman did not win the Academy Award for Best Director until Catherine Bigelow won in 2009 for her Iraq War drama The Hurt Locker. To this day, she remains the only female winner of said award out of the 91 times that award has been given. The lack of female representation in creative and crew roles in the film industry is one which affects most, if not all, major movie markets. And Japan is no exception to this, as we'll be discussing today. So anyway, if we're going to be delving into the subject of women behind the camera, why don't we start from the beginning, with Japan's first female director, Tazuko Sakane. That's what I would be saying if her only fictional effort, 1963's Hatsu Sugata, or New Clothing, was still in existence. Sakane was an exceptional woman. She circumvented the system that most later female directors would go through via the studios, where they would enter as actors, then transition into directing. Instead, Sakane followed the traditional male route to directing, which was to begin as an assistant director, most prominently to Kenji Mizoguchi. Mizoguchi was later noted as working with several women who would go on to become directors, but more on that later. Sakane has been noted for cutting her hair short and adhering to what was seen as the masculinity of her career path, though she was also noted as lending a feminine sensitivity to her work. So I guess it's a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. New Clothing was a flop, leading to Sakane to not be offered another directorial position on a fictional film, instead going on to direct a number of documentaries. And somewhere along the line, any known prints and negatives of New Clothing disappeared or were destroyed. Her documentaries are similarly elusive, or else we might be covering one of them today. Instead, for this episode, we will be looking at the first film directed by Japan's second female director, Kinuyo Tanaka. Tanaka entered directing in the manner more common with the few female directors of her era. That is, she was an actor first and foremost. Born November 29, 1909, Tanaka began her career in the late 20s at Shochiku, appearing in a few pictures by Yasujiro Ozu. Before long, she was acting in a number of films by Ozu, Kenji Mizoguchi, and Mikio Naruse, all monolithic directors in their own rights. Later in her career, she left Shochiku and began to work for other studios as well, where she would go on to appear in films by Akira Kurosawa and Kon Ichikawa. By the time of her death in 1977, Tanaka had acted in over 150 films, making her a remarkably prolific actor. In the 50s and 60s, after Tanaka had established herself as something of an icon, once compared to the contemporary Hollywood star Betty Davis in terms of clout, she used her influence to direct six films of her own. The Directors Guild of Japan at one point recommended Tanaka for a position with Nikatsu following her first film. Mizoguchi himself tried to combat this suggestion, despite their having worked together on 15 projects previously, including her starring roles in his arguably biggest works, Ugetsu and The Life of Oharu. Luckily, Nikatsu still offered Tanaka the job, but her relationship with Mizoguchi was never repaired. Obviously. So today we're looking at Kinuyo Tanaka's first feature film, Love Letter. And I know what you're thinking. Didn't we already cover Love Letter? Well, not quite. See, way back when we talked about a film called Rabureta. But today we're going over Koibumi, the 1953 debut for Kinuyo Tanaka. The film was produced by a newcomer to our show, Shin Toho, or New Toho, a short lived studio founded by workers who had left Toho in the late 40s after a schism. Shintoho was actually one of the biggest studios of the era, before folding in the early 60s from bankruptcy. And perhaps appropriate for a cobbled together new studio, the crew of Love Letter was also all over the place. The film score was composed by Ichiro Saito, who worked in his long career with a huge number of big directors of the era, from Yasujiro Ozu to Mikio Naruse, to our friend from A Page of Madness, Teinosuke Kinugasa, as well as Kenji Mizuguchi. Cinematography was done by Hiroshi Suzuki, who had previously shot films perhaps most famously for Mikio Naruse. It's through all of these similar names popping up again and again that we can begin to see how everyone during this era really did know each other, thanks to the strength and impregnability of the studio system. Except for the rare exceptions of freelance workers who happened to work with everyone across the board. 
The film's screenplay was adapted from a novel by Fumio Niwa, who had published several novels during World War II while traveling to China and New Guinea to observe the situations there. At the time, these novels were censored for being too controversial. Love Letter, as a result, handles circumstances dealing with World War II, though perhaps not in as direct a manner as one might expect given its genesis. It was one of six of his stories that were adapted for film, with Love Letter having a screenplay penned by Keisuke Kinoshita, a director and writer who two years prior to Love Letter's release had produced the first color film in Japan, Carmen Comes Home. For the bulk of his career, Kinoshita wrote and directed for Shochiku, which explains his connection to Tanaka, given that she had her start there. Kinoshita wrote the bulk of the films he directed, but also worked on scripts for others, as happened with Love Letter. The film competed at the Cannes Film Festival, where it was nominated for the Grand Prize, before opening in Japan on December 13, 1953. Keisuke Kinoshita would win the Blue Ribbon Award that same year for Love Letter's screenplay, along with his other screenplays from 1953, A Japanese Tragedy, and Sincerity. Anyway, enough background. As usual, if you haven't seen the film yet, we definitely recommend you go and find a copy before you continue. Of course, Love Letter seems to have only had a Japanese DVD release, and the only English subtitles that we've found are fan subs, so this one might be a bit more difficult for everyone. Either way, let's proceed. Love Letter revolves around two brothers, Hiroshi and Reikichi Mayumi. Hiroshi, the younger brother, makes a living as a book salesman who buys foreign books and flips them at a profit. Reikichi, on the other hand, speaks English and French and works as a translator from home, taking care of the two brothers' apartment in his spare time. Reikichi runs into Naoto, an old friend, who offers him a job as a translator for Japanese women writing love letters to foreign soldiers with whom they had affairs. The film is set five years following the end of America's occupation of Japan, meaning that most of these men are now long gone. These women rely on the French and American men to send them money to support themselves and sometimes the children that they have left behind. Reikichi accepts the employment offer, though Hiroshi is upset by it. We learned that Reikichi was a sailor in the Japanese Imperial Navy during the war, and thus harbors certain resentments toward the foreign occupiers in the post-war period. Hiroshi, on the other hand, sees the job as one that is very base and unflattering even unnecessary. He then tells Rikichi that he saw an old flame of his at a station nearby. Her husband passed away in the war, and it seems that she has returned to town. The remainder of the film explores this new career for Rikichi, as well as the backstory between himself and this mysterious woman, Michiko. Through flashback and in the present, we uncover a web of complicated relations between the brothers, Michiko, and the anomalous soldiers who formerly occupied their country. Much discussion is had between the characters and with the audience concerning changing perspectives of masculinity and femininity in post-war Japan, as well as who gets to write the stories of these women. Well, I'm not gonna lie, when we first came across Love Letter and saw it listed as a romance, this is certainly not the movie I was expecting. You might have come to think just from that title and the era in which it was produced that it was going to be a romantic romp about two lovers reconnected after so long by a love letter or a chance encounter. And that's what you get, in a way, until the characters go a step beyond this and Reikichi starts laying into Michiko about her past. Consider, however, the cultural gulf at the time, and it may explain the difference in tone. World War II assisted America in regaining a foothold as a major world power following its Great Depression. Not to say that we were at a risk of falling off the map, but the sheer stimulus that the war provided our economy skyrocketed us back to being a world leader in terms of prosperity, and our weapons advancements during the war cemented our place for the rest of the century as a world power. The so-called economic miracle that Japan was to experience after the war, that is, the largest, most boundless period of economic expansion in the country, arguably ever, had not set in just yet during the 50s. Suicide rates were still high relative to the next three decades. Anti-American sentiments were raging thanks to the American occupation forces being present throughout the country for years after Japan's capitulation. And the country was still firmly in a period of reconstruction, not miracle. It's easy to see when you consider this how American films of the early 50s might be concerned with a stereotypical Hollywood romance, while Love Letter is rather cynical in its depiction of contemporary love. 
The one decision concerning Love Letter's story that is perhaps most striking is that it does not concern the narratives of women living in post-war Japan directly. Rather, it follows the stories of two brothers, one disenfranchised by the fallout of the war, and the other too young to have been drafted in the first place. In this way, director Kinuyo Tanaka isn't directly trying to tell the story of being a woman in Japan in the early 50s. No, she's telling the story of how women were viewed and treated in Japan in the early 50s, and how the war and its after effects not only produced the cynicism expressed by Daihichi, but also had a direct negative impact on these women's lives. Repeatedly, Michiko is asked to forgive Reikichi for his treatment of her, as he is emotionally abusive at times. Other times, it is acted as though his distaste for her decisions is wholly justified. Yet, if we look below the veneer of the surface narrative, we can see that Michiko's decisions were those of circumstance, and were perhaps not entirely what she wanted in the first place from marrying a man who she did not truly love thanks to familial pressures and the threats of ostracism if she went against her parents' wishes, to her befriending women who were social outcasts due to their occupation, to bearing a Japanese-American child who would likely face its own societal rejection as it grew up in a society incredulous toward non-ethnically Japanese children. One could argue that Michiko was simply dealt a bad hand by the society of the time and place. In fact, Michiko is not alone in these matters a point which we see reinforced repeatedly throughout the film, though it is never explicitly stated. Whenever we see Japanese women in Love Letter in familial or professional settings, they are always remarkably submissive. Michiko's stepmother, who we learn from the Lady Mayumi in flashback is abusive towards Michiko, is seen on screen as nothing more than a submissive housewife during her father's decree that she cannot marry Rekichi. We hear of her misdeeds, but by all appearances, she is the lesser of the two partners in terms of power dynamics. When the young shop hand is away from the shop owner, she is flirtatious and playful, but under the eye of her employer, she is formal and relatively submissive. The restaurant at which Michiko works is staffed by equally passive women. The only time that we see women being assertive regularly is when they are commissioning love letters at Naoto's shop and away from the watchful eye of society and their families and jobs. Perhaps, then, it is not a mistake that the narrative of the film itself, which is ostensibly concerned with the relationship between Michiko and Reikichi, ends up being more focused on the grief that the social abnormalities of Michiko's past cause for Reikichi rather than the strife that Michiko has had to endure as one partner she was forced to marry died, and another moved away following an unwanted child's birth. This lends itself also to the subtext through the film of women being robbed of their stories by men. There's a cliché phrase that you've most likely been exposed to, history is written by the victors. This sentiment is so common in fact that no one is ever sure who said it first, with attributions being given to everyone, from Napoleon Bonaparte to Winston Churchill to even Adolf Hitler. But perhaps Michiko's narrative within Love Letter is a play on this sentiment, though with the phrase not being taken in terms of literal war. Instead, Tanaka examines how, within a historically masculine and patriarchal society, women are given voices publicly by men who speak for them. Again, consider the submissive stepmother, whose husband speaks for her. Or, for a more on-the-nose example, look no further than Naoko and Narekichi's job, writing letters for women to communicate false sentiments to men for the sake of gaining cash and support. In other words, by their very occupation, these men are speaking for women, and, in some cases, enjoying it. You may have already heard of the concept of the vocal minority, that a group can be misrepresented by a small section that is simply louder than the rest. This idea is seen in practice, robbing Michiko of her story with the three women who accost Hiroshi and Michiko toward the end of the film. They, like most of the women that we have encountered throughout the film, have relations with foreign soldiers to varying degrees. However, this small contingent of women who knew her during only one portion of her life very vocally associate Michiko with prostitution, here seen as inherently lesser and wrong. Thus, this vocal minority of women in the film contribute to Michiko's inability to tell her own story. Most of the women who patronize Naoko's shop seem mainly to keep to themselves and not bother the others about their foreign lovers, meaning that they have no real impact on one another. But these women are able to redirect the course of Michiko's life simply by being louder and more obnoxious with their opinions of her than anyone else. 
They reinforce, at least for Hiroshi, the stereotypes associated with these women who have had sex with or married foreign men. It should be noted that early on, when we mentioned Kinuyo Tanaka being called the Betty Davis of Hollywood, the comparison became almost self-fulfilling several years before Love Letter was released. In fact, in the late 40s, Tanaka made a trip as an ambassador of the arts, visiting cultural centers of the US like Hollywood and New York, where she would meet a number of major stars of the time, including Betty Davis herself. However, upon her return, Japan was still under US occupation, and for a time, Tanaka's trip was seen by Japanese citizens as a traitorous action. Instead of it being taken as a successful endeavor for bridging the gap between two industrialized nations, it was seen as her selling out to the enemy. Tanaka, however, took what has been called, quote, the independent and creative female identity she witnessed in America, end quote, and put this cultural outlook into her directorial work. In other words, she used what she had witnessed and learned to begin a new portion of her career, where she could potentially encourage women throughout Japan to demand better than how Michiko is treated throughout Love Letter. This strengthens the idea that she was using Love Letter and Kinoshita's script to make a cultural and political point, rather than simply tell a story, and that Michiko's purpose as a character is to report through fiction how women may have been treated during this era in the real world. <laughs> 